Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. I hope everybody had a great Christmas break. I know it feels a bit strange saying this in February, but this is our first webinar of 2021. So thank you for joining us. I'm joined today by our chief engineer, Stephen Barker, who will be leading the presentation. And then later, our major projects manager, Andy Sharp, will also be joining us for the Q&A session. These webinars aim to fill the void that real life event cancellations has brought as well as providing the opportunity to encourage conversations between companies and to keep everybody safe at work, share industry best practice and promote thought leadership in the construction industry. February marks 40 years in the temporary works industry for MGF, a time that has seen expansion of the business, not just geographically, but into new markets and gaining, gated, gaining, losing my words, gaining great attraction in the shoring industry. MGF are recognised as one of the leaders in the design, manufacture and provision of modular and bespoke excavation and structural support systems. We are committed to providing our customers with complete engineered solutions and providing current best practice for all types of excavation works and supporting safety, piling and lifting departments. We are delighted that just over a month into the new year, we have made some amazing progress such as opening our second structural support depot down in Tring and initiating a black box campaign where 10 of our standard trench boxes have been painted black and branded with the logo of a charity chosen by each of our shoring depots. The proceeds of which of the hire of each of these boxes over the duration of 12 months will be donated to the charity by MGF on behalf of the depot. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to ask questions, which we will go through at the end. There's a chat box at the bottom of the, of the screen and also a Q&A there. We're monitoring both, so whichever way you ask your question, we will pick it up. Alternatively, you can send your questions through as an email to marketing at mgf.co.uk. We will also be running polls through this webinar, but these are only available when you're watching live on Zoom. So let's get started. I'll hand over to Stephen now, and I hope everybody enjoys. Thanks, Emma. Uh, morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Emma said, I'm Stephen Barker. I'm a chartered civil engineer, and I've been working with MGF for around eight years, with the majority of this time focusing on the design of temporary propping solutions for deep basements. So today I'll be talking generally about temporary propping of deep basements from the perspective of the supply chain, covering typical considerations at design stage, some of the issues that I've come across and the benefits of modular systems. I'll hopefully be joined on some of my experiences over the last six years um, to highlight some areas where efficiencies can be gained through increased collaboration, whether that's uh, early engagement at pre-construction stage or more direct con communication between the relevant parties during the design phase. Um, with a good example of sort of some successful collaboration we've done on one of our recent projects. So there's several considerations that drive the direction of a temporary work solution, but I've picked out just a few that I think are quite important. Um, so site logistics, which plays a big part, is if the site is small or the basement covers the footprint of the site, it might need a section of slab being constructed to provide space for site cabins, material storage, or access for plant. Um, using this area of a slab as a prop can remove the need for temporary propping entirely, or otherwise props have to be coordinated around plunge columns, um, which can cause access issues also. Uh, alternatively, you could have quite a long site with access only from one side and have to ramp down into the excavation, which can impact where props can be spaced, or it might require a sequence of installing props as excavation progresses towards the access point. And then probably the key element would be the retaining wall design, as this influences everything from installation levels, uh, prop loads, stiffness assumptions, and sort of requirements for removal. Uh, ideally, this should be coordinated with the permanent structure, making sure that the sequence is logical and proposed popping levels allow the structure to be built without obstruction. Um, should also take into account positions of vertical elements, such as cores, and also how these are going to be constructed. So for instance, if cores are to be slip formed, but the wall designers design makes it necessary to prop above the cores, it's going to create a bit more work in repropping walls with raking props to remove props that are causing the construction. As you can see there in the picture on the right, we retrospectively installed raking props to allow the flying shores in the background to be removed and the central core to be uh, constructed. Um, 
And then understanding the sequence of construction before work start can be quite important as it's can inform whether additional restraints required, which could be difficult to implement when the prop is in situ. Um, you'd be quite surprised how often we get a call asking us to, can the sections of propping and whaling beams be removed as they've cast a section of slab early and now want to take that section out. But as the intention hasn't been communicated, actually putting the measures in place needed to restrain the other sections of propping and whaling beam just can't be done. So it has to stay in place. Um, then with these general considerations that influence the propping arrangement, there's also a multitude of other considerations that sort of the temporary propping designer is thinking about when they're putting together a workable scheme. I think the main one's probably the prop capacity. This um, gives us the maximum allowable spacing that we can achieve whilst making sure the props can deal with the expected loads. Um, and then generally we prop into a reinforced concrete capping beam. So the capacity of the permanent works in that temporary state has to be considered. And this will also dictate how, how far we can space the props. I think generally in my experience, uh, we aren't provided with any information on the capping beam other than the size of it. Um, so we have to usually conservatively estimate how far this can span. And then this is often just detailed to suit our conservative estimate anyway. So there's not really much economy in there. Um, then movement and stiffness is a key consideration. Usually these basements are in quite sensitive areas and the stiffness assumptions from the wall designer, which essentially specify in how much our props can shorten and to comply with the design assumptions um, is a limiting factor in the design of hydraulic propping solutions as hydraulic props are naturally less stiff than a steel prop. But they do have the benefit that you can preload the props, which um, reduces wall movement and also almost pre-shortens the prop to a degree and negates the reduction in prop stiffness. Um, most of the basements I've worked on have been quite awkward geometry, um, things like re-entrant corners. Uh, which have to be propped to, to stop any um, excessive movement. Uh, quite often the return walls of these are quite long and they can act as a buttress or a shear wall, removing the need to prop. But again, this is a, an assumption that we sort of take from experience, but it has to then be passed back to the wall designer to confirm. The impact of temperature on increased loads in props is quite pronounced in steel. Um, it could require larger sections, which actually perpetuates the problem or mean that we need to put additional props in to lower the load from the ground on each prop so they can deal with the additional load due to temperature. I'll be touching on the effect of temperature on hydraulics a bit later on in the presentation. Um, then connections as well. If we're working collaboratively, we can design connections such as reinforced concrete cobbles that are cast as part of the capping beam um, that then just need to be broken off at the end of construction. Or we can cast in um, short length of steel section for props to butt up against, which then removes the need for excessive drilling and fixing of post fixed anchors. However, quite often capping beams are already cast or they're not allowing, we're not allowed to cast anything into the capping beam. So we have to go down this anchor route, as you can see in the, the image there. This isn't ideal as it's, you have to have someone standing there drilling. So I think that port has got 12 anchors, uh, 10 anchors, sorry. Someone's drilling and fixing holes. The, potential for clashing with rebar is quite high, um, so it's not ideal. Uh, in this situation in the project, in the photo there, we had about 120 anchors on the project. So we actually opted to cast them in instead as the, re as the reinforcement was quite dense and we couldn't cast any other elements of steel in. Um, we worked quite collaboratively with the cap and beam designer to ensure that the actual reinforcement cage could deal with the excessive shear forces caused by the local uh, anchors, which allowed us to sort of shrink the shear plate and remove the need for um, excessive couplers, as you can see there in the photo, there's couplers all along. Uh, I think it should be a poll popping up on your screens now to do with CDM, which I'll discuss at the end of the slide, but I think CDM 2015 brought about the roles of uh, the principal contractor and the principal designer to manage health and safety risk during construction of the design phase, uh, which is one of the duties of the principal designer to ensure risks are minimized and controlled through the design, through the design phase. But I think in my experience, this tends to be focused more on permanent works with the responsibility for temporary works passed on to the contractor. Something I quite struggle with is in, in my view, I think assessing the need for temporary works is part of minimizing and controlling risk. Um, and then being in the supply chain, our element of the design phase is often being completed as construction is ongoing with significant time pressures. The responsibility for temporary works keeps getting passed on until the contractor then has to start the works. So by this point, risks and costs start to increase as constructability issues have to be dealt with by introducing 
more temporary work materials or which could have been foreseen. In early on, they designed out subcontractors and the specialist designed to hopefully some results from the polls there. Interesting, quite an even split. I know sort of from the temporary works uh, standpoint, I think in particular the supply chain, um, there isn't much collaboration with the principal designer, in my experience. I think something the temporary works forum are also uh, agreeing with to an extent. So now I'm just going to run through a, a project I was heavily involved with for around two years, from 2016 to 2018, where um, there wasn't much collaboration during pre-construction. So it consisted of quite a large two-story basement, as you can see, which is around eight meters deep, 120 meters long and 60 meters wide at its widest point. So the client had split the project up into a series of work packages. So by the time MGF and actually the main contractor as well had been engaged, um, the perimeter secant power walls had already been designed and constructed. Um, so the wall here was formed with 750 mil diameter secant piles and required propping around 1.5 meters below ground level until the ground floor slab was constructed. So because the prop level was so far below ground, that we couldn't use a capping beam, so we had to use the steel whaling beam. So it wouldn't actually be possible to construct the liner walls up to ground floor. And also due to the size and depth of the basement, it wasn't really possible to detail the propping to clear the cores. As you can see on the photo, there's quite a lot of props flying across the excavation and all along this long length was about five or six cores. Um, so we initially proposed reviewing the wall design to see if it was possible to raise the prop level two and a half meters, getting them above ground level and then utilizing concrete corbels tied into the capping beam, which would enable the props to clear the ground floor slab and allow construction to continue unimpeded. Um, unfortunately, the consultant reviewed it and the wall was too efficiently designed. And also the capping beam was only around 400 mil deep, so couldn't deal with the uh, space in between props or the torsional forces from the props being above ground floor level. So in order to then get back up to ground, the permanent works had to be constructed in two phases, with the first phase to a level just below the um, high level propping, and then installing a second level of propping off the partially constructed permanent works, which allowed the high level propping to then be removed and construction to continue. Obviously this sequence increased the program. There's a lot of work to do in getting the additional propping installed and then removing the additional propping, at, the original propping at height. And then also getting the replacement propping out from under the ground floor slab once the works were completed. So the original props were spanning around 50 meters and the heaviest prop weighed around 48 tons. So getting these out at height wasn't an easy task at all. And it introduced quite a lot of risks such as you know, working at height to get the slings in place and releasing props from the whaler not to mention the risk of lifting a 50, mil, a 50 meter long chunk of steel. Um, in order to do this, uh, they had to close a major road in Belfast city centre for a weekend and also bring in a mobile crane, which gave them the space then to land the props on the ground and break them up into pieces. So looking back at this, if there had been quite a, lot, a bit more collaboration during pre-construction rather than these isolated packages of work, a lot of this could have been avoided. So for instance, the perimeter walls weren't up to the site boundary, so could easily have been increased in diameter without losing space within the basement box. And the capping beam could have been detailed appropriately in the temporary case to bring the props up to a level that they didn't impede construction of the ground floor. This would have completely removed the need to spend time installing the additional props and also eliminates the need for a mobile crane as the props could then be supported off the ground floor slab and broken down into short lengths that the tower cranes could then handle. So the, as you can see, this, this relatively simple change would have reduced the program, saved on materials, and also removed a lot of the unnecessary risks. So I think this sort of highlights that collaboration, not collaborating, can introduce more problems. But then obviously collaborating can bring about uh, some benefits too. Um, so for increased safety, for instance, by collaborating early on, we can collectively design out a lot of the risks or appropriate and manage the risks by thoroughly considering each stage of the works before the construction actually starts. Um, and then by having common design assumptions uh, or knowledge of the structures that we're building, we can actually design the structures based on how they were built rather than building them based on how they're designed. Um, 
quite a common thing that we have in here with basements. We'll have a, a basement design come through with a cap and beam that says props at max seven meter spacing. So this spacing hasn't taken into account that the props may be clashing with vertical elements of construction. And it's just a design for a cap and beam in isolation. Whereas if there was collaboration at that design stage, the cap and beam could be designed to, alongside the propping design. And you could have a solution that actually effectively uses the capping beam and the prop into the maximum capabilities and reduces the, the risk of any clashes further on. Um, we can incorporate more intelligent design solutions, such as using the observational method, where we can incorporate technology to control the risks of design assumptions, meaning we can produce more efficient solutions and have sort of backup plans in place if the worst case scenarios start to become apparent. Um, so I think it's quite obvious that the more collaborative we are, the more successful and efficient our projects will be. And I think, you know, the, the poll there shows that. Um, but I think in order to achieve this, the industry need, really needs to shift its focus uh, and then we'll really get the benefits out of it. So in my experience, typically clients are splitting up works packages and they're aiming to drive each individual package cost down. But what they're saving is potentially a loss further down the line through extended programs, constructability issues start to um, arise things that could have been identified through engagement with subcontractors in the supply chain early on. For example, in the project we saw previously, say they saved uh, £50,000 on piling by having a smaller diameter pile, but the solution actually slowed down construction due to having to do the repropping. So the savings are lost quite quickly in material costs and losing a month or two on your program. Then following off from the um, design phase and into the construction phase, the use of modular systems can also continue to add value. So there you've got reduced procurement and installation time. So these products are off the shelf and they have in dis inbuilt adjustment facilities. So it takes out all lack of fit on sites, so things are a lot quicker. Um, this also brings a lot of safety benefits as it limits the need for any hot works and wet trades on site. Um, and also the products are rigorously tested. So it provides that assurance that they're gonna be able to do the job that they're designed for. Uh, quite a big topic in the world right now is climate change and sustainability. And I think, um, you know, these systems are designed and manufactured to be reused over and over again. So generally the carbon footprint is simply the transport to and from site when you look at the whole life uh, cost of it. So if we are looking at whole life carbon reduction that's sort of indicated by PAS 2080, then this is quite a significant benefit to the project. Then in terms of risks to adjacent infrastructure, the ability to preload can limit limit wall movement, limit ground movement, which subsequently limits the risk to any adjacent infrastructure around the basement. And then instrumentation. So intelligent design requires the use of in, in, instrumentation and, and these systems are very easily instrumented. So there's no need to install or calibrate strain gauges on site because a lot of this is generally done in the supply chain yard with very little on-site installation. So I'm just going to play quite a short video now which demonstrates how this works. So now I'm just going to go over a, a case study where we've actually realized the benefits that I've just discussed. Um, so this is a project we helped deliver last year where we were engaged quite early on, around 12 months prior to work starting on site in order to work collaboratively with the main contractor and the temporary works consultants to develop a, the overall best solution for the project. Um, this development was in central London. It required a 17 meter deep four story basement that covered the full footprint of the site, as you can see in the photo there. They had a, an access gantry in the top right corner so they could access directly from the road. Um, 
this project was in a historic England conservation area. And I think the design was quite ambitious, 17 metres deep with only two levels of propping and a 900 mil diameter secant power wall. So based on the initial design, we developed our solution, which consisted of corner bracing in each corner, um, supporting a capping beam at high level and a modular whaling beam at low level, which gave us approximately six metre space in between props and a large central area in the middle in order for the core to be slip formed. Um, as the excavation was so deep, um, the loads we were supporting were, were really quite high and the propping system was working at around 90% of its safe working capacity. However, following an independent review, a finite element study was carried out on the whole support system, which showed that several of the props could be exposed to loads around 30% higher than the safe working load. Um, if we were to try and accommodate this, it would mean reducing prop spaces to around three meters uh, in places and obviously struggling with the with gantry, the access gantry and the plunge columns. This wouldn't have been ideal at all for the excavation because it would have extremely restricted space. Um, so we had a few discussions with the main contractor and the temporary works consultant and we, we proposed an alternative approach of utilizing load monitoring so that we could manage the discrepancy between the two analysis models. So what this allowed us to do was develop a, a backup plan and proceed with the best case scenario of the initial design. This allowed us to maintain the ability of increasing the strength of the system if the monitored loads were looking to creep towards the worst case scenario. Now, as the basement progressed and, and we, the monitoring regime progressed, we, we noticed throughout the whole basement, monitored loads only peaked at around 93% of the predictions that they were from the analysis. So if we'd have worked in isolation and, and we hadn't had this collaborative approach, we'd have gone with the, the, the um, results from the finite element study, which would have extremely over-designed the support system. And it could have culminated in quite a lot of increased costs due to additional temporary works materials. And also increasing the excavation time as it's very difficult to dig in the corners with, with limited space between props. I think the investment in load monitoring on this project actually saved a lot of a lot of cost. It was very small in comparison to the costs of increased excavation time, which prolonged the program and the additional materials required. So I think it demonstrates the value in early engagement with supply chain and continuing that cross-party collaboration during the design phase. I think this is quite a successful project in that they were ahead of program on the way down to formation level and also ahead of the program by the time they got back up to ground floor level. So I think it demonstrate, definitely demonstrates the value in early engagement. So one of the other benefits we get from instrumentation is the ability to better understand how propping systems behave. So the more we understand about how they behave, the less conservative assumptions we have to make. So I think one of these behaviors is the response of hydraulic props to temperature change. So by calculation, based on codes of practice and established guidance, the unfactor thermal load on that project we've just discussed would have been around 2,250 kilonewtons for a steel prop, which is around 66% of the actual safe working load of the prop. But when we actually monitored the loads, we saw that the observed temperature increases were only around 400 kilonewtons, so, which is around 20% of what the guidance told us it would be. So we can definitely see some benefit in studying this further and reducing the effects of temperature on hydraulic props. So we're conducting some research with some of our academic partners to, in order to develop robust design solutions, uh, robust design methods for hydraulic propping, which will reduce thermal loads and, and produce ultimately more efficient solutions. Um, I'm just going to play a short video that demonstrates our understanding of how this works. So here, looking at this, we have a hydraulic and a steel prop side by side. So as the excavation proceeds, the props become loaded by the ground. The atmosphere gets warmer, the sun starts to shine. And as the arrows show there, the steel starts to expand. So the retaining walls get pushed back slightly before they then begin to offer resistance to the expansion and the steel prop starts to experience increased load as it can no longer expand. With the hydraulic unit, this absorbs some of the expansion as the fluid compresses before the expansion is constrained. So loads then experienced by the whole prop. So as a greater proportion of the steel expansion has been accommodated due to the combined effect of wall movement and, and hydraulic shortening, rather than just the wall movement, the increased load in the prop is smaller than for a purely steel prop. And then conversely, 
you know, when the temperature starts to drop overnight and the steel contracts, you don't then get additional wall movements as the hydraulic is a fixed volume of fluid that's under pressure. So when the steel is no longer pressing it down, the hydraulic naturally wants to then expand again, as you can see in the video there. So just as a bit of a summary, um, I think the key points I was hoping to convey today are that in order to derive maximum value in projects, we should be aiming towards shifting the focus to early engagement at all levels, bringing in cross-party collaboration and sort of harnessing the latest technologies. You know, doing all this can bring the industry together and allow us to share data and continuously improve upon our current design methods and construction methods and all our collective experiences that ultimately is going to result in safer, more sustainable and more economic projects going forward. So thanks for listening. I'll uh, pass you back to Emma now and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Thanks, Stephen. I'm sure we can all agree that was um, a greater insight into the basement and major projects industry from a temporary work supplier perspective. If anybody has any questions, could you just please put them now in the chat box? And whilst we wait for those to come in, I just want to note that we will be sending a feedback form out after this. I have put it in the chat box as well. And we'd like everyone to fill it in with as much detail as possible to help us improve our future webinars. As a bit of an incentive for this, we're going to offer everyone the chance to be entered into a free prize draw to win a £50 Amazon voucher. So we're delighted to announce that the winner from the last draw is Navdeep Dillon. So Navdeep, we will be in touch with you for your prize. We are running these webinars on a monthly schedule. So our next one is booked in for Wednesday, the 17th of March at 11 o'clock. The topic for discussion is digital collaboration for temporary works designers and will be hosted by our engineering director, Steve Hesketh. We hope that you'll join us for this and any future webinars and you can find more details on our website and you can sign up to this next webinar also in the chat box at the side now too. If there's anything you'd like to discuss outside of this webinar, then please contact us at marketing at mgf.co.uk. But for now, we'll just take some questions. So I've seen that one has come through. So guys, uh, there's a question come through saying, was there an additional structural wall cast up against the pile wall that came in about the first project, the Belfast project? Yeah, so I think there was, uh, I think it was from memory around 250 to 300 mil um, structural line of wall up to the face of the pile, yeah. Okay, um, so some extra questions we've had. So what would you think would need to change from a procurement perspective to allow early collaboration to happen? I don't, Andy. I'm gonna take that one, Steve. Yeah, I think that's one for you, Andy. Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's fairly simple. It's um, maybe sort of client awareness is, is probably the key to it. Um, um, if, if they're aware that when they're letting out lots for say the piling contractors, um, the bulk excavation, the temporary works, the, the RC frame uh, to get you out of the ground. Um, it's about having an awareness of how um, each of the individual elements that come together to, to complete the projects, um, how they come together and how they, they integrate and fit, fit together best. Um, so you're not always necessarily looking for the, the cheapest price for your piling. It's about what gives you the best value to, you know, to, to construct a permanent works and, you know, and complete the project. Um, okay, we've had another one to say, um, how does using preload affect the stiffness of the props? So preloading doesn't actually necessarily affect the stiffness. The, the prop will still shorten the same amount under load. But what it does do is reduces wall movement so it, it, it in order for the actual movement to occur the wall then has to overcome the load that's already in the prop so the prop's already shortened to a degree and it has to then further shorten it based on exceeding the load that you've already put into the prop okay and we've had another one asking which um which of the mgf equipment was used in the the case studies um, the whaling beam consisted of our uh, 406 uh, bracing system. 
um, and prop extensions were a combination of our 400 series, which is a, a 400 box section or square hollow section, sorry, um, a six, our 600 series, which is a, a 610 uh, circular hollow section and our 1000 series, uh, which is a, a 1067 by 15 mil uh, wall thickness uh, circular hollow section. Um, that covers the first and second uh, case studies. And on the first case study, we, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, there was a, a 1067 by about 20 mil wall thickness for the 52 metre long clear span props. Yeah, it was a nine, it was 19.1 thickness um, yeah. and obviously enhanced the um, strength of the splice connections with stiffening plates to allow it to span up to the 50 metres and the lower it was anticipated. Yeah, and, and then each of the props were uh, combined with a combination of our 2,500 kilonewton and 3,500 kilonewton safe working load hydraulic units. Um, so I had another question in the chat saying, on the second case study where the original propping design was used instead of using the finite element results, what would have been the remedial measures if the props were found to be exceeding capacity during monitoring on site? Um, so, well, essentially, it would have, we'd have had to introduce additional um, props as part of a sort of contingency measure. Um, the, the depot that supplied the job is only I think 12 miles have been, you know, in sort of geographical distance. So because we, we, we were able to have a sort of combination of, of the extensions and the hydraulics to, to hand, um, you know, we can, if, if there were issues, we would have seen the loadings increase beyond what, you know, what was shown in the, you know, the, the, the um, limit equilibrium design and, you know, and, and the, 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 the piling contractors analysis. Um, and if, if, if exceedance were, going up you know, beyond what you'd expect at that particular stage of the excavation and quite quickly we could have mobilised additional equipment you know and to and deliver it to site and get it installed before you know that there would have been any, you know, a sort of a, a structural issue with, with the propping system. Yeah and just to add to that I think that there was obviously an amber level and a, and a red trigger level so yeah. the red trigger level was obviously the introduction of additional props but the the amber level was a method of, of trying to reduce movement um, by digging in bays rather than uh, digging across the whole excavation. So digging out localised sections at a time. So it limits the overall wall movement and then assessing that movement. And if it was still creeping up, then obviously would then put um, additional propping in place. Yeah, I, I think as well, because the, in terms of timing for the project, it, it, we sort of installed late, late spring and obviously the props were in, in situ sort of during the summer months. So around about 10 o'clock in the morning because the, the thermal loadings were increasing um, and you was getting up to you know, the amber trigger levels, which is what we were, you know, were expecting to see. You know, you, you could sort of set your time, you set your watch by it and uh, you'd get the automated text through saying, you know, prop P3 is, you know, up to 75%, you know, and you could sort of log onto the, uh, onto the web portal and you can see the actual loadings in the props sort of real, real time. So, you know, it was a, uh, it was uh, pretty good, and yeah, a few phone calls um, from from our um, uh, uh, contractor that we supplied the equipment to, and you know, and it was a uh, yeah, good sort of collaborative effort, and everyone was aware of how, how the propping system was behaving. We've had another one asking: Do you feel that one of the main issues around early engagement of proprietary temporary works providers? is that the permanent works engineers do not have a remit from the client to engage at an early stage due to temporary work still being seen as a contractor responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think that is one of the key issues. Um, and it's, it's something that so the temporary works communities are actively discussing through the temporary works forum. And then there was re a recent article in New Civil Engineer that was discussing this as well. So looking at how the client needs to shift their focus to make sure that you know, they are giving the remit to the permanent works engineer, but also that the permanent works engineers, these, sort of these multi large multidisciplinary design houses are, are actually bringing in specialists rather than, you know, looking at their own risk profile and saying, no, we don't have the insurance to cover this. So we'll pass that on to the contract. But actually getting that remit from the client and then engaging with specialist designers during that initial phase um, is definitely the key way that, that we need to do, go to solve this. And then I think this is the last one that's come in. So if the fragmentation of the design chain means that designers take the view that someone else will sort it out, 
would making a single designer responsible for the whole project delivery assist in reducing the problem and bringing safety benefits? I mean, I think that's almost what what CDM I think is trying to achieve with the principal designer of coordinating sort of the different design information. Um, but I just don't think it's gone far enough in, in, in actually making them responsible for getting people speaking together. I think it definitely, I think having one person responsible for it isn't necessarily the best way to go because you've, it depends how you determine how you de define responsibility. If they're as a design house doing all the work, they might not have the necessary specialist experience of certain aspects of construction that they need. Um, but definitely, if they were responsible for making sure that the project had the relevant design teams necessary, and they were responsible for making sure everyone was communicating, I think definitely that would, that would help in reducing the problem. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Andy. Um, I think you, you pretty summed it up pretty well, to be fair. I, I think it's, 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 the, you know, the, there's a number of professional parties around the table, and, and it's about coordination and communication. And if everyone is working together um, between us, you know, we, we can solve the issue and you know, and come up with the, the, the best solution for it. For it. Cool. Just on the back of that last question, um, same person's asked, should a, P should, a, should a PD bring in someone to advise on a temporary works in the pre-construction phase if they don't have that expertise? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I think at the minute, a lot of it is just passed on to the contractor. Um, you'll see the typical notes on drawings. So yeah, one of my favourites is... Uh, you have a retaining wall right up against the site boundary, uh, cast in situ with a, a dashed red line between that and the site boundary saying temporary works by others and there's no room to fit any temporary works in. So I think having that with the principal designer and having that sort of temp temporary works advice can go a long way to sort of definitely getting um, pre the pre-construction right and ultimately construct the construction right. Okay, cool. So um, we'll wrap up there then. So I'd just like to thank both Stephen and Andy for participating and I hope to see everybody in the next webinar and hope everybody stays safe.